Hi, my name is Samuel Barclay. I'm the co-founder with my wife Erica of Case Design. We are a practice uh, founded in 2013 based in Mumbai, India. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about the way that we uh, conduct our practice and share some of our projects with you today. Um, first off, I wanted to thank Rodrigo and Amelia for inviting us to be a part of the Porto Academy. I know that these are not uh, the ideal conditions that we're facing today, but I hope everyone out there is safe and well and uh, that we get a chance to come and meet you all in person next year. If uh, the opportunity presents itself, we would certainly love to, to come and do that. Um, I wanted to share, as I said, a little bit about our practice today. Um, Part of the reason that we've decided to practice in India is really the way that we can uh, conduct ourselves, the kind of people that we can work with, collaborations we're able to have, not just with uh, people in India, artisans, craftsmen, but uh, also access to uh, other parts of the world uh, as well, engineers, artists, uh, farmers, all different kinds of people. We really rely on a kind of broad spectrum of collaborators for a lot of the projects that we do and really try and tap into um, different kinds of voices in the uh, design process at a very early stage. Uh, and a reason, part of the reason for that is that I've always grown up um, in a workshop environment. I've really enjoyed the process of making, the process of uh, building things with my own hands. Um, I, both of my grandfathers had workshops growing up. This image here is actually a picture of our workshop in Mumbai. Um, and <clears throat> so workshop culture has always been something that's been a big part of uh, my aspirations when it came time to, to form a studio and to sort of mold it in, in our vision. Um, and a big part of that is uh, the use of sort of tacit knowledge. Uh, what we found uh, by practicing this way is that rather than being able to sort of transfer information in a way that, um, you know, either written or verbal, uh, we really find that uh, the use of uh, experience and mentoring and really taking a kind of hands-on approach to the process is something that's really important to us. And I came across this quote uh, about a year ago that I thought was really uh, important in sort of understanding. Again, uh, tacit knowledge is rooted in context, experience, practice, and values. Um, it is difficult to communicate. It resides in the mind of the practitioner and is passed on through socializing and mentoring. And one of the reasons that, uh, again, I mentioned the kind of part of the joy for, for me uh, personally, but I think collectively as, as a part of our studio, in practicing in India and practicing in particular in the way that we do, is that uh, the, the design process as a social uh, endeavor, uh, the way that we can create dialogues, not just with clients and with um, technicians, but also with the artisans and the craftspeople who are actually physically building this thing with us. And hopefully some of the images that I share in the coming slides will help to illustrate that. Um, these, these two pictures are, um, again, very much our design process. The one on the right is uh, an image uh, during the process of building the school that we've been working on. And the gentleman holding the pen is a sort of 70 year old master mason. He's kind of uh, an all arounder, as they would say in, in Mumbai. Um, he, he's a carpenter, he's a mason, he does plaster work, he works with bamboo. And the, the drawing that he's making on his hand to kind of illustrate his process is uh, sort of going around the design process for building a well. Uh, as the primary source of water for the school. And he's having that conversation with um, Anand, who's our project manager for that project. And so what I like about both of these images, the image on the left is a carpenter that we work with. That's my, uh, those are my blue jeans there. But what I really love about these is that in both cases, the craftsperson is the, the person holding the writing instrument. 
um, and that's something that we've worked hard to to nurture and to encourage uh, but it's also something that uh, these these people are very um, these two specific uh, Pundaram and, and Malakar have been very quick to um, kind of accept and, and take up and push forward and, and be excited about is, is becoming more invi involved in that dialogue. And we found again and again across, across the board that the more um, investment we can make in that conversation, the better results we get in our, in our projects. So rather than um, investing a lot of time making sort of very detailed drawings with I'll say the limited knowledge that we have or the limited experience that we have in sort of some of the more technical uh, parts of the design process, we're always happy to uh, have a kind of constructive, meaningful dialogue with, with the people who will actually be building it. This is Bavarla, this was a, you know, a detail of, of uh, for a piece of furniture we were, we were building and shipping off to Dubai. Um, a big part of our studio is uh, is detailing and how things are specifically uh, made and come together. We deal with large scale public works architecture, kind of medium scale, uh, going down to residential. We do interiors as well, uh, exhibitions, and all the way down to furniture, lights, locks, latches, hinges. We do sort of the full range of things based on what each project calls for. Uh, this is another good example, I think, of uh, sort of engaging in that design process. The image on the right is um, a photograph of a, the model of a house that we'd constructed uh, out of teak wood and we'd brought to the site. And the, the pictures on the left uh, were sort of the, the meeting of the people who would be building the house with the physical model that we had made as designers in the studio. And, and what was really interesting, these are this was for a rammed earth house that we were hoping to build in the mountains between Oman and Dubai. And what we found when we started engaging with the people who would be building it is that they were uh, Afghani. They were coming from kind of very rural landscapes in the mountains of Afghanistan. And they very quickly saw what our aspirations were and identified that back with their own uh, sort of local to their, their home. Uh, the kind of building culture and building technologies. And so they started talking about, we had hoped to build it in rammed earth, and then they were suggesting perhaps a, a version of cob or a, a version of sort of formed uh, or form r stacked earth built without form work, um, a kind of dry, uh, uh, dry kind of more stacked mud uh, version of earth construction. Um, but they use this model to kind of demonstrate uh, not just um, what that process would be like, but what the outcome would be as well. And so for us, it was a very interesting dialogue. Um, again, I'd mentioned sort of details, handles, hinges. Uh, this was for a residential interior that we were working on. And the image on the right um, for me is a really illustrative one that sort of talks about the design process that quickly things for us can go from a simple sketch, uh, plan, section, isometric, uh, a few key dimensions, a WhatsApp message, it goes to uh, the carpenters that we work with, a teak wood model comes back, uh, typically at full scale, depending on what the sample size is. And then from that, it can be given to either somebody on their team or a machinist that can be turned into brass uh, and we can test the mechanism, we can hold it in our hands, we can feel the proportions, we can make adjustments. And so for us, this is kind of a, a super critical uh, modeling technique that uh, gets us very quickly from concept to kind of a working prototype. Uh, and so again, part of having investing in the culture, the workshop culture, the culture of making has always been a really critical uh, part of our studio as well. These are, I'd mentioned, um, some of the furniture and lights, objects that we make. This is a part of our collection, uh, which we call case goods. Um, again, these are pieces, some of which have come out of projects that we've done. Some of them have emerged just as sketches or things that we use in the studio. 
Uh, but again, it's really grown organically as a part of our process. And now these have uh, started to, we're starting to sell these around the world. We have retailers both in India, but also in, in Europe. And we're always looking for interesting partners to uh, collaborate with in terms of galleries and, and showrooms and things like that. Um, but again, it's very much born out of our material research, exploration, ideas, projects, processes, things like that. Um, a lot of them are, are, again, artisanally made. This is a chair that we had designed for a cafe that we were building in Dubai. Um, we had to get 10 chairs in 40 centimeters, so each one had to fold flat into a 4 centimeter or less uh, thickness. This, this one got down to 38. And so um, part of this is very um, mechanically made in terms of you know, standard machined planing and things like that. But you can see the backrest is still done in a very um, simple but sort of tried and tested uh, technique where the, the piece, there's a template and the, the individual craftsman kind of um, hews this piece of wood down to the final shape and the comfort of that uh, slightly curved backrest. Again, I'd mentioned interiors. These are some of the <clears throat> materials and processes, terrazzo, uh, mosaic tile, um, and different, uh, different materials coming together. We use the interiors a lot as ways to kind of explore um, different uh, details, different material combinations. Uh, obviously, we, it, it enables us to work very intimately again with uh, the artisans and craftspeople that we've been working with uh, now for for almost a decade, and uh, yeah, it's it's a nice kind of laboratory for for research and exploration. Um, we also take those findings um, and apply them at a larger scale. This is a farmhouse uh, that we're developing outside of Mumbai, about two hours outside of the city. Uh, it's for a family who is building a kind of organic farm. Um, and so we've worked with, uh, we're working with an organic farmer. We're working with a uh, collaborator named Andy Hamilton that we've worked with on several different projects now. He's a landscape architect in, based in New Zealand. Um, but we're developing this 23 acre site. There's a river here. Um, developing this site, uh, the main farmhouse is here. Uh, a productive vegetable garden here, mango orchards, a water collection reservoir, um, uh, different forms of uh, organic rices, and um, so different, um, yeah, just different uh, organic uh, farming practices and developing the master plan, but really trying to rely as much as possible on the sort of local indigenous species, everything from wildflowers to uh, nitrogen fixing plants to kind of bring in some of the permaculture practices as well. These are some of the early models for the house. And again, the, that process of engaging with the people who will be constructing it, uh, the, the carpenters who will be physically building the house itself were the ones who collaborated with us on building the model. And what we found by engaging with them at a very early stage in that process, it really gets them involved intimately in the design conversation, the detailing uh, conversations about framing and the arrangement of structure and all of those kinds of um, sort of critical details that go into the process when it comes time to build it physically full scale on the site, they will have been active participants at a very early stage um, and can carry that, uh, carry that history along with them so that they understand the context of how the decisions get made. And it, we find that investment in that process really, um, one, it's a heck of a lot more fun, but it also enables us to um, have a bit more freedom in terms of the way that we're able to uh, move with agility uh, as, as the building is being constructed. So in a bit more detail, this is uh, really one of really our first project. This was uh, uh, an NGO project. It's a, a four acre campus, 
for uh, specifically for education of young women. It's a middle school and high school for uh, young women in in India. It's based just outside of Pune in a, a small valley called Lavale, and. Uh, this was, as I mentioned, this was the first project. This is what enabled us to found the practice. Um, it's actually still going on to this day. Uh, it's slowed a bit because of the virus, but all six of the, the major structures are up. In the, the previous image, you saw these one, two, three structures looking from uh, the northwest, uh, looking sort of southeast, and you could see these three here. Um, these other one, two, three buildings here are also fully constructed. We're beginning to do the grading on the soccer field as soon as we complete a rainwater harvesting tank underneath it here in the, the down, downhill uh, corner. And we hope to also raise enough money to build uh, a bamboo gymnasium, um, hopefully further on down the road. Um, as I mentioned, that we put a lot of... Um, Kind of care and attention into uh, kind of each phase of the design. We we worked with local farmers to develop a kind of natural irrigation system that uh, uses the water that we collect from the wastewater system to uh, irrigate the entire landscape. So 100% of the irrigation water used to uh, water all of the uh, vegetables, the ornamental plants, the grasses, everything here on this site is produced by the recycled water that we take from the gray water and black water septic system. Um, this is a sloping site as you saw in the first image there's about a 27 meter drop from this uphill corner to down here and what we've got in this process is a series of rainwater harvesting tanks, one here, one there, one there, and these are, uh, sorry, not green water harvesting, uh, reed bed filtration, <laughs> I misspoke. Um, so these reed bed filtration tanks take the gray water and the black water from the, each of the buildings. They run it through a series of plant bed filtrations that then overflow and go down to a final UV uh, filtration pond down here which is at the lowest elevation, that water is then pumped back up the hill and used to irrigate the landscape in these water channels that you see uh, at various points throughout the campus, coming along the boundary walls, splitting off to irrigate each of the, the kind of beds as they move through. Um, this is, uh, I can't remember if I mentioned, but this is a residential campus. Um, and so one of the things we knew we needed to do was to accommodate um, women who would be living, these young w women students who would be living away from home for the first time. So what we tried to do, going back to the plan, was to create uh, a greater number of smaller buildings to try and reduce the scale of each of them. We knew it would be an institution, but we didn't want it to feel institutional. So we tried to create, uh, as I mentioned, a greater number of smaller buildings in order to make each of the residential spaces more intimate. Uh, additionally, we also uh, wanted to create, rather than have separate um, places where the dormitories would be isolated in one place and academic spaces would be somewhere else, each of the buildings, each of the six primary buildings has both academic and residential functions. The lower levels, ground and first floor being uh, academic with various programs. This is the library, cafeterias here. This is sort of administrative and leadership. These are um, entrepreneurial. These are Indian studies and in science and technology. And so um, really splitting those up in the lower levels being academic, the upper levels being uh, residential in order to make sure that there were sort of no dead spots on the campus that all times of day and night that the campus was sort of was in constant use um, and that was something that we really tried to uh, convey across the entire campus this is again i'd mentioned before malakar mama and the construction of the well uh, this was an existing uh, open excavation on the site that we had uh, observed we tested it we made sure that there was sufficient water for for what we 
required throughout the year, again relying on the tacit knowledge of Malika Mama and his team. They constructed this brick well on, on site. Um, and then again, these are some of the water channels that I had mentioned. So these very, very simple irrigation water channels. You can see the brick here, which is the, the kind of standard unit of measure if you want to close off the stream. This gets wrapped in a cloth. It gets placed over this opening that blocks this and the water continues down the channel. If you want to send water out of this, you take that same brick and you place it perpendicular to the channel and then the water comes flowing out. You can see how that functions here in this uh, in this space. But if you compare, this was the landscape that you can see here, sort of very barren, very dry. And as soon as you sort of spring a little bit of care and attention, of course, uh, the water that's collected from the rebeds, immediately you get uh, signs of greenery and signs of life. Um, this was partway through the construction. You can see here, this is the library building in the foreground, the leadership center on the left. The girls are playing football in the, the entry court. You can see the cafeteria being constructed here in the background. Um, the independent of anything that we've done the the young women of the school are just incredible um, sources of inspiration their uh, their intelligence their enthusiasm their curiosity um, the kind of spirit that they bring to this this space is really really remarkable uh, so it's been a pleasure to work with them on that um, again we tried to keep things very simple uh, we always describe these uh, these buildings as kind of dumb boxes that we kind of dress up uh, in in the simplest way that we can. Uh, you can see the use of a lot of exposed uh, bamboo work. You can see the exposed concrete there as well. Very, very simple, lightweight steel structures to form railings and staircases internally. Um, mosaic floors, which I'll share a little bit about in a moment, the, the exposed but painted uh, ceilings here, and then obviously the exposed block work for the walls. Um, again, this was this is an example of <clears throat> part of the process that we try and engage with. The image here on the left is a photograph um, of Picciones, uh, the paving that he did uh, on the steps to the Acropolis. I was really inspired by this image. I wanted to sort of create something like that for for the campus. I shared this with the the kind of head mason that that does that we work with in a lot of our projects. And I said, "How can we create something like this with almost no budget?" And he said, "Well, that's actually pretty simple. Let's let's get quarry waste. Let's get uh, broken pieces from salvage from shops that that don't want it." And for the cost of transportation, these people will basically give us the material. And so we worked with, with him and his team to develop this, uh, this mosaic. Um, his name is Rameshwar and his, again, by investing in his tacit knowledge, his investment in his team in dialogue and conversation and sampling and, in uh, working with these incredible artisans, they're able to create uh, this beautiful sort of tapestry uh, as a material experience. Uh, we've, there's no drawing for this. There's nothing that we've done other than to sort of bring a reference image, have a conversation about it, work with them to create these samples. But rather than having us, you know, make an explicit drawing, give dimensions, give detailed specifications, this is uh, a sort of experience and a materiality that's really come out of uh, a conversation and uh, a s shared set of values and a, a kind of uh, an aspiration to, to create something unique and beautiful with very, very limited uh, means. And so for me, this is kind of the beauty of the project. Uh, again, simplicity. Uh, we found early on in the process, the girls needed uh, Initially, we thought furniture to store their bags, to store their books, things like that. Um, and we realized very early on in the kind of detailed study that we had to do to balance the budget that actually 40 millimeter thick slabs of marble cost less than plywood. And so for us to create those, uh, those kind of storage devices, we built them into the wall. We used 
this very, very inexpensive gray white marble that's um, generally used for constructing interior kitchen cabinetry that never gets seen. It's buried uh, sort of behind shutters. And for the doors and windows, we actually use salvaged uh, old Burma teak wood as well. And what we found for that was it wasn't actually a savings. It was comparable to the cost of uh, newly manufactured doors and windows, but the, the material quality uh, in terms of the durability, in terms of the longevity, um, and obviously in terms of the tactile experience, the, the physical beauty of the material itself, um, very much became a no-brainer for us that, that we could have this kind of richness of, of real wood as opposed to a composite material, a sheet metal material, uh, extruded al aluminum sections, things like that. And so for us, uh, it became a very simple set of decisions once we understood the economic equation. But had we not invested in kind of that bit of research to understand the, the budget and the opportunities, I, I don't think we would have come to that solution. Um, another unique thing about um, the school is uh, that there's no mechanical system for it, or not a traditional one in that sense. Uh, we worked with uh, Pratik Ravel from Transolar Climate Engineers. Uh, they're based in uh, Frankfurt, I believe, in Germany, but they also have an office in New York. Pratik um, is somebody that I had worked with on a couple of other projects uh, years before this and that I kept in touch with. And, and so when we got this project, I, I kind of invited him to come on board. And what we started talking about uh, was this idea of a passive cooling system that could use um, just the, the physical properties of the building materials itself uh, as a way to create uh, a more comfortable thermal environment for, for the students and, and the campus community. And so his, his proposal was this series of uh, solar chimneys in combination with uh, what we we're calling earth ducts below the building, you can see here in the section. So these uh, these tubes underneath the building are these massive concrete hume pipes. They're about 900 millimeter internal diameter. And then those coupled with uh, this sort of shaft or series of, of shafts going up through the core of each of the buildings, um, creating solar chimneys that are evacuating air at the roof. So the simple principle is that uh, by collecting um, solar energy here at the roof, these large vertical concrete walls absorb the heat of the sun. They're encased on three sides by glass. That creates a greenhouse that heats the air, which creates a stack effect and creates a convection that pulls the air up and out of this shaft. You can see these red arrows. So at the upper two levels, these are the dorm rooms. So it pulls air out of those at the ceiling level. Fresh air at the upper levels comes in through the doors and windows we, to, as a way to provide cross ventilation. And in the lower levels on the classroom side, the earth ducts provide cool air that runs in through the north side, the shaded side of the building. It runs underneath the building, cooling the air further. And then that air comes into the classroom at the floor level uh, it mixes with very simple ceiling fans, and then that air is exhausted out uh, as it becomes heated. It is exhausted out through the ceiling level going through the, the solar chimney. And all of that is, um, again, just, I wouldn't say very simple, but very precise calculations based on the thermal mass of the floor, uh, which is a concrete slab covered with stone mosaic, the thermal mass of the ceiling, uh, we made uh, digital models of the, each of the buildings. We shared those with Pratik. He then uh, plugged in the weather patterns, the, the sun orientation, the wind pattern, the local weather map, precipitation, humidity. Um, we came to understand that uh, what the temperature is only one factor in terms of comfort, but it has to do with uh, you know quantities of clothing, humidity, uh, solar exposure, all of these different uh, characteristics um, sort of feed in to affect comfort that is beyond just simple temperature. But taking all of those factors into consideration um, 
and understanding in detail what the building materials would be. Uh, this was the, the proposal that we came up with. And what we found in the process of having constructed it uh, is that we're getting between five and nine degrees temperature drop um, between the outside air and the inside classroom temperatures, um, depending on different times of day, different times of year, different conditions in different parts of each of the spaces. So we found it to be quite effective, uh, the solar chimneys in combination with the bamboo screen, which is used for both uh, solar to, to um, for solar shading, but also for privacy and a bit of uh, wind and rain protection as well. Um, I'd mentioned the, the mosaic floor, again, similar concept to what we had done with the paving, but instead of using uh, pieces of broken limestone and granite, in this case, we used marble from different regions um, around India. Different regions have different colors, obviously, because of mineral deposits and things. So we had uh, parts that were pink and green and yellow, grays and, and whites. Um, each of the spaces we tried to, again, work with uh, different combinations of those colors to create a very unique um, color combination for each space. Um, in that process, we worked with an artist from uh, Copenhagen, uh, Malena Bach, who's a, now a dear friend of ours. Um, but uh, she worked with us to create uh, a natural, uh, uh, not a natural, but a, a local, using local pigments and natural oxides to create a custom paint for the ceiling. Um, the as i mentioned it's critical for the for the working of the uh, passive cooling system that there's no false ceiling so these are the exposed structural slabs uh, and they just have the uh, the pigment that she worked to create uh, applied to them this is her uh, actually on on the scaffolding again engaging directly with the artisans who would be doing uh, the actual work she's here sort of demonstrating the, the thickness, the application, the, the different techniques, brush strokes, um, and, and testing it and seeing how it performs for herself. So it's a bit of research, it's a bit of sampling, it's a bit of teaching. Um, you can see all the beautiful colors that she's worked out. These are all different trials that, uh, that we had gone through. And then uh, the application ultimately was decided to more or less leave the walls as they were with the kind of very simple cement washed uh, bricks and to primarily color the underside of the concrete slabs. And so she, along with Duani from our team, worked out each of the buildings, each of the spaces, what the combinations would be in coordination with the adjacent landscape in coordination with the mosaic floor in different spaces and how those color combinations would work together. Uh, she's really created this incredible palette that uh, brings so much richness into it. I'd mentioned the uh, bamboo screens as well. So this is some of the research that we did in our studio scale models. This is again Malakar Mama uh, developing prototypes at his home. And then this is kind of the final application onto the school. Again, knowing when to cut the bamboo, how to treat it, how to keep pests away, how to have it survive through the monsoon. Um, and to just, uh, again, a lot of these things are things that you can find in books if you, ha you know, if you do extensive research, but the tacit knowledge that he had access to just from his own experience and his willingness to share that with us was, was so incredibly rich and so made such an incredible contribution to uh, to the campus. So we took those principles that we learned at Avsara and, and the other projects that we'd been working on uh, in and around the same time. And we had an opportunity in 2016. Again, this is still still going on to some degree. They were getting ready to open this project, but the uh, pandemic is kind of held that aside for a moment, but we had an opportunity to create a, a collection of guest houses in Zanzibar, uh, which is an island off the coast of Tanzania in East Africa. 
um, the entire island is made up of coral limestone, so it's effectively a, uh, a monolithic um, uh, rock formation that's effectively calcified uh, coral from uh, hundreds of thousands of years of uh, aggregation. And we wanted to, uh, obviously we were inspired by the beauty, the, the sea, the landscape, um, it's just an incredible kind of tropical experience. But what we found very quickly on the site was that the site, if you remember the first image, um, the site was very rocky and very, um, uh, it wasn't barren, but it had very kind of scraggly, uh, uh, very hardy plants growing on it because there was literally no soil. All the plants were growing uh, directly onto the rocks, uh, which I'd mentioned this coral limestone. And so one of the very first things that we did uh, was to create a nursery. We had come to meet, this is a photograph of Shehab, uh, who's the client here on the left, and uh, Franco, who's the permaculturalist that we happened to meet. Um, and Franco uh, since then has also become a client and a very dear friend as well. But initially he was just this uh, kind of uh, not a mad scientist, but just an incredibly passionate um, driver of our ambitions to create this this landscape. Uh, his knowledge and his experience uh, with permaculture and his, his partner um, Bernadette as well um, just provided us with so much energy, knowledge, enthusiasm, experience about how to literally grow a landscape on the site. And so one of the things that we realized very early on is that we would need to develop this in a kind of very passive way, the amounts of water that would be required to sort of create an instant landscape or something we didn't really have access to, the soil content wasn't there. So we developed with, with him or they actually developed and, and shared with us this technique of permaculture where you grow fast nitrogen fixing plants, you chop them down, that creates biomass and through composting and, and vermiculture that you create uh, this uh, this very passive landscape, but that you can do it in a relatively short amount of time. Um, again, this is a project that we worked on with with Andy Hamilton, the the landscape designer from New Zealand. This is his master plan for for the site. Um, and as I mentioned, this is a collection of guest houses. It's very much focused on the idea of community and to encourage people who are, are visiting, even if they are meeting each other for the first time, to kind of not necessarily spend time in their rooms, but to really enjoy the landscape and the natural beauty and the kind of communal spaces that are uh, a part of uh, the project. Again, going back to our sort of tried and true method of, of building models, physical models that enable us to study proportions, construction processes, um, you know, techniques for building. Again, the landscape is a very important part of this. These were things that we worked on in our studio. We actually carried these with us to meetings with the clients in the US, in Dubai, uh, and in Zanzibar as well. They were. Uh, they were based in all those different places and eventually got to the process of uh, construction again trying to keep things very very simple using local materials this is uh, the again coral stone taken from uh, locally from the island different parts have different again different minerals and so they have different colors to them this was a, a very beautiful simple kind of corally pinky salmon kind of color, exposed concrete slab at the mid-level, uh, exposed concrete parapet and staircases you can see, but trying to rely on local building techniques, uh, local practices so that we weren't doing anything that was uncharacteristic in the region, either from a design aesthetic point of view, but mostly from a kind of building technology to really rely on, on local practices. This was the team that we were working with. And you can see here, this was Simona. He was kind of the star of the project. He's an Italian architect that had worked with us in Mumbai for, it was around six to nine months or so. And he, uh, when the project really got underway, he actually moved to Zanzibar for two years and worked uh, on site to, to make this project a reality. 
so this is a lot of his hard work in combination with everyone else from our team and, and Franco, Bernadette, Andy, the clients as well. Again, trying to keep things simple, minimal, uh, efficient, very basic steel, bent steel rod for the for handrails and parapets and things. Um, again, this is the process of the landscape coming in. You can see even here in this, even this, this far into the construction, the, the soil is very, uh, very rocky. In the end, we took the compost that we had been working. We brought in a very little, minimal amount of soil, planted things. Um, the difference in, you know, the planting here had happened maybe a month or two before the planting here. This zone was next. But you could see um, Zanzibar, it's very tropical. It also has uh, several periods of rainfall throughout the year so that if we were able to provide uh, nutrient nutrient rich soil uh, things would propagate very very well and very quickly so um, this is these are some of the photographs from that process uh, some of the interiors again simple uh, trying to respect local traditions as well this is what's called a barasa which is generally a large stone or concrete plinth that exists uh, on the veranda again trying to introduce that idea of of the social reality of of uh, the context and to encourage people to spend time not necessarily in their bedrooms but actually on their verandas in the landscape or uh, in the communal spaces this is another project we were fortunate enough to work uh, with melena on um, it's always fun to have site meetings with melena she brings an incredible spirit to uh, to anything that we do and it's uh, it's a great pleasure to <laughs> share a site with her so you can see this is a good example of what happens when you let an architect choose the color the uh, the typical gray was <laughs> the first room where I I chose the color and then by the time we were able to get Melena on board she obviously brought a much richer palette which you'll see in some of the future slides she set up uh, set up camp in the nursery because it was the coolest space with the uh, a nice breeze going through and a gentle humidity. Um, these are some of the, the samples that she made, again, working with uh, colors that were local to the region, that were relevant to the landscape. The, the light is different in Zanzibar than it is in India, than it is, you know, in Europe or in the U.S. And so she really, um, really took a lot of pride in, in making uh, everything kind of relevant and appropriate and contextual in that sense. Uh, so these are some of the interior colors. Each of the nine rooms in the first phase uh, have a different color palette. Uh, that was something that the clients were quite keen, keen to uh, work out. And again, this collection of kind of dumb boxes that were each one loosely arranged, but with specific uh, view corridors, relationships to the neighbors, uh, roof terraces, verandas, things like that that, that we really tried to uh, carefully place to make very nuanced. Each of them, again, are very simple rectangular volumes, but we tried to make very nuanced uh, experiences in each of them. Again, working with uh, local craftspeople, we did bring um, two artisans that we work with in India over from uh, over from Mumbai to uh, both lead a couple of the teams to do a little bit of training and to do some of the more uh, skilled uh, joinery things uh, that we needed mostly in the stonework uh, but uh, very quickly we found that the the local teams uh, we were able to identify who the kind of leaders were in, in each of the groups and um, and then work with them to develop the details that we needed uh, this is work that's going on in the swimming pool, uh, the pool pavilion, which is being constructed in the background. And you can see the beautiful turquoise waters of the ocean in the distance. This is, uh, as I mentioned, so here's Simona, that's me on the right, and Milena. Um, the meetings were much more fun once the pool was <laughs> filled with water, but uh, some, some fun conversations, to say the least, in the process. Uh, this is these are images of uh, of the communal space the steps up to the platform this is the the dining space here in the foreground a shaded pool pavilion the swimming pool is right behind it 
and then this is the kitchen block with some of the public restrooms and things like that this part is very much waiting for the landscape to come in which is in a much uh, much more dense shape now but um, yeah it's been a it's been a fascinating process to really conduct something from afar but we found that again the uh, the opportunity to have something sort of so far afield was really the expectations of that were really met by having somebody um, on the ground and having Simona there to really uh, anchor our um, our roles and responsibilities and kind of seeing this manifest. It, it would not have been possible without his without his presence and Farhan as well from our team. Uh, so I'd mentioned Franco and, and Bernadette um, in the process of, of working on th those guest houses with them. Uh, they came to us and said that they had a small piece of land uh, about an hour away from the site. And would it be possible to uh, build a house completely off the grid, which was something quite exciting for us. Um, we've always been interested in in doing something like that uh, the difficulty in india is always uh, to uh, supply a source of water uh, the the region that we're in um, in maharashtra around mumbai we get about four months of rain continuously and then for the other eight months of the year they don't get any rain at all so rainwater harvesting always becomes a challenge in that part of the region but in zanzibar they get periodic rains throughout the year so very quickly, we, we realized uh, that rainwater harvesting would be a, a great way to sustain the, the domestic water needs for the house. And so we set about designing a house to collect water, um, looking again at very, uh, this was another project that we tried to really control the budget in a very simple, minimal way. We, we took inspiration from the local, um, the local village houses. This is the barasa that I had mentioned earlier, this very simple stone or, or cement uh, plinth that's used as a kind of a social space uh, that always typically faces the, the public road. Um, again, that, that interaction with your, with your neighbors. Um, and so we set about creating a house that would, uh, as I mentioned, collect the rainwater. So all of the, it's a very simple plan. I'll show the plan first here if that makes sense very simple plan a courtyard house um, four simple spaces each with kind of services as a part of it bathroom kitchen things like that but if you go back to the section each of those roofs are lightweight corrugated metal again a, a kind of local solution cost effective um, with the proper insulation can also be um, uh, it's a, a lightweight, effective, lightweight and effective way to keep the rain out, to keep the sun off uh, and provide shade. And as long as you can provide enough ventilation and insulation, um, you can keep the heat out of the spaces as well. And at the same time, collect the water that comes off those roofs. So we, we worked to design a very simple underground cistern uh, that the water collected in the courtyard would then be filtered and taken into that cistern. Um, again, this is the physical model that we constructed to sort of explore the ideas and test things like proportion. The plan I had shown before, so you enter from here, uh, this is to the east, uh, this is west facing the sea, um, north is here and south is, actually no, Sorry, north is here, south is here. Uh, the dining space, um, master bedroom here, a kind of study space, kitchen. Uh, they're both actually also former chefs in addition to being permaculturists. So cooking and the preparation, gathering and preparation of food is a big part of um, how they want to live their lives. And then a, a guest bedroom for, for family and visitors. Uh, we also wanted to, again, keeping in mind uh, local context, but also the environment. Um, Zanzibar is a place where the use of lime, uh, lime uh, stone, lime mortar, and lime plaster is, are all sort of traditional means to um, 
to uh, build both um, large public buildings but also residential as well and so the the process of, of building with lime is much um, more environmentally friendly than building with cement so that was something that we latched on to right away so we won't use one uh, one particle of cement in this entire process it'll all be limestone block which you can see uh, from a local quarry here lime mortar and lime plaster and for me part of the beauty of that is that the the limestone the calcified coral the limestone landscape that the building will be built on will uh, effectively become monolithic with the building itself uh, over time so we'll have uh, we'll excavate the cistern the cistern will then be lined with block work and and plaster the walls will come up from there there'll be limestone blocks that are stacked using lime mortar and then covered with lime plaster and as those things uh, solidify and calcify they'll become monolithic again at the same time we know that the qualities of lime are far more um, there's health benefits they breathe there uh, they retain humidity in a different way than, than concrete does so there's not just environmental benefits but health benefits obviously the the reduction of pollution and things like that but it's also a very local and traditional material and we're able to find uh, a lot of the uh, builders in the region who are able to work with this material um, again simple simple model as a way to not just convey these ideas to the, the clients and the uh, and our design team but also to the builders and engage with them in a in a dialogue uh, to develop the details to work through the design process um, in a way that not only enriches the final outcome or what we hope the final outcome uh, manifests into but also the the process of uh, communication and engagement not just with the clients but also with the people in the region in the neighborhood in the community and and in that way uh, we we hope that we are able to create a project that has roots that are already established uh, by the time the project is finished um, so this is the this is the last slide thank you for your time and for your interest and as I said I hope um, I hope that we're able to do this in person next year uh, it's a tremendous uh, opportunity for us and I hope that uh, I'm able to see the Academy sometime soon Stay safe, be well, and uh, thank you for this opportunity.